It's my genuine pleasure to introduce Paul Flesher, who will be speaking about Church and State, A Difference to Die For, which will be a historical and co contemporary review of the relationship between Church and State. But it's my particular pleasure and all of our pleasures because Paul, we are seeing Paul in a different role today. You may recognize him as the moderator for the previous Saturday University programs and he is a very strong partner representing the University of Wyoming. He's also a former Wyoming Humanities Council board member. But Paul is also a fine scholar in his own right. So again, we will be enjoying, and Paul, we hope you will be enjoying this today as well, <laughs> instead of doing these responsibilities. Um, but I particularly want to thank him because he has, I would say single-handedly, really been a, a very strong partner in encouraging the University of Wyoming uh, administration to recognize the uh, significance and the popularity, the success of this program in Jackson, and so much so that he has encouraged the administration to support the expansion of this program to Gillette and Sheridan. Uh, so we will be offering this Saturday University program, the Wyoming Humanities Council and University of Wyoming again, in Gillette on March 31st. Uh, so we really want to thank Paul, not only for speaking today, but for being a very fine uh, partner and part of our uh, team between Laramie and, and Jackson and now Gillette and Sheridan. But as I said, he's a fine scholar in his own right. He directs the Religious Studies program at the University of Wyoming, and he teaches everything from religions of the ancient, ancient Mediterranean to comparative world religions. Um, he has been at the University of Wyoming for 18 years. Uh, he is a, a, scholar, ancient, a scholar of uh, ancient Judaism. He is a two-time president of the International Organization for Tar Tar Targumic Study. He did his undergraduate work at the University of Rochester uh, and then graduate work both at Oxford University as well as Brown University. He actually is a uh, speaker from the University of Wyoming who has grown up in Wyoming. He wasn't born here, but he did grow up in Sheridan, Wyoming, and we always uh, want to recognize that as well. He also studied in Jerusalem, Jerusalem for a year, and he has published a, a blog and a column for the last 12 years entitled Religion Today and that is presented as a column in the Casper Star Tribune, but, but again, it's also a blog, and I would encourage you to ask him about signing up for that. I know I received that um, on my email, so uh, again, he's a very active scholar as well as an active public scholar beyond the academy. So we're really looking forward to your presentation. We hope you enjoy today, and Paul, we hope you enjoy as well. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Marsha, for those uh, kind words and, uh, and for your thanks as well. Um, it turns out that the topic of church and state has become a hot topic. Uh, <laughs> when I was asked to do this, it was sort of the, 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 the request was sort of, you know, let's, let's have an academic exercise. Let's explore the relationship between religion and government in some sort of, you know, a heady, calm, neutral manner. Um, and of course, then I thought about it and I thought, well, let's, let's link it to something recent and current and uh, uh, relevant. And so I thought, oh, well, you know, the Arab Spring has just happened a little over a year ago and, and that would make a good focus. And so I, I designed the talk around that notion. And then of course, uh, things uh, developed here in the United States. Um, in the last couple of months, we've had a major uh, uh, contender for the president, uh, Republican presidential uh, candidacy uh, actually start questioning the very foundation of the relationship between church and state we have here in the United States that our founding fathers so carefully put together. Um, and then even more recently, we've had uh, uh, the, the almost the entire Republican Party start accusing uh, the, the president of of oppressing religion uh, out of an issue originally uh, that had nothing to do with religion, uh, healthcare. Uh, so I, I'm not gonna talk directly about sort of the current events and, 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 and politics. You can ask me, I will give you maybe some sort of answer later during the question time. But, but I'm gonna wander through a whole bunch of things that will be relevant. And so hopefully they will set up ideas about how to think about uh, some of those questions. Now, before I get started, let me give you 
all my caveats so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm a scholar of religion and in particularly a scholar of comparative religion and I view this as an exercise in comparing religious phenomena across time and across uh, religions. Um, I'm going to take in a lot of time, 3,000 years. I'm going to take in three major religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Uh, and I will make it very clear right up front it is that I am not an expert in 3,000 years of religious history of all three religions. Uh, this is really going to be a, a look at several comparative moments uh, in the development of the relationship between government and religion uh, across this time uh, as, as an attempt to see how it uh, all fits together. So here's my question. In the modern world, how should the government of a nation and the religions of its people be related? What are the possibilities? I mean, one of the ways to answer this kind of question is to um, just sort of make stuff up. But, but as a historian, I would like to go back into the past and actually look at real things that real people decided and, and carry, tried to carry out in some way. Um, so we're going to do that. We're going to start by jumping all the way back uh, to Judaism. And if we think about Judaism's classic founding, okay, Moses, you know, taking the people out of Israel and uh, heading across the desert and meeting God at Mount Sinai where he gives them uh, the covenant. Okay, they become God's chosen people and he gives them the Torah. Okay, classically the Ten Commandments, but there's a whole bunch of laws in the books of Exodus and uh, uh, Leviticus and uh, Deuteronomy that are added into that and that's just the beginning and it grows to this large body of material, uh, all of which is attributed to Moses, uh, which governs uh, religion, society, uh, civil commerce, uh, uh, governance, etc. But one of the interesting things is that, of course, with Moses and the people of Israel being out in the desert, there's not much space for government, uh, uh, let's be blunt, um, or commerce for that matter. Um, so what we really are seeing with Moses is the creation of a religion led by a religious leader, a prophet. Um, once we get out of the desert and we, we, uh, the Israelites settle in the land of Canaan, um, God starts putting together uh, the um, government, at least that's the way that the, the uh, Hebrew Bible, Old Testament uh, presents it. Um, and he starts with these things that are called judges. And uh, it has to be one of the, the least appropriate names for a title. Because these guys aren't judges. These, almost every one of these people are a military leader that God raises up uh, because um, they, they need a fighter to raise an army and to uh, drive off some oppressor, whether it's the Moabites or the Philistines or, or who it may be. Um, and each one of them is chosen uh, by God. So there is, this isn't a succession, it isn't uh, a, a kingship or anything. It, each, each individual is, is out there and chosen by God. And while the emphasis is on maintaining the worship of God, according to the Torah, uh, these judges are really military leaders. King David starts off as a military leader. At first, he's a, he's a warrior under King Saul. Very young, he kills uh, uh, Goliath with a, with a slingshot because he isn't old enough and strong enough to actually hold a sword. Uh, but he then develops into a, a very uh, good military leader. Uh, he ultimately breaks from Saul, has his own mercenary army, which he wanders around using, uh, partially uh, among the Israelites when it's needed, but sometimes he hires himself out to some of the Philistine kings even, uh, a real sort of military over everything else. Uh, ultimately, he becomes king in about 1000 BC, um, and then, um, am I hitting the wrong button? Let's try this one. Let's try this one. There we go. Okay. Um, 30 some years later, he dies. His son Solomon takes over. 
And Solomon really is the one who consolidates the notion of a monarchy for ancient Israel. Uh, he becomes an executive. He pulls together an entire sort of state administration. Uh, everything that that uh, needs from, from military to, you know, a big court uh, where, you know, various ministers uh, serve the needs of uh, uh, labor, etc. And, of course, he also is the one that builds the temple. So this executive is the one who essentially creates the religious center for ancient Israel. Uh, the religion is, of course, run by the priests, a group of officials. We know a few names. But by and large, they are a nameless uh, a group of people. And the king, of course, runs the government. And together, they are seen as um, one society. I know it's volume, but it's not supposed to be. So I'm going to have to give up on that. All right. So here's our first model, OK? Uh, religion and government combined with society sharing the leadership. Religion provides ritual, moral, legal guidance through rules and laws, and they're led by a class of leaders that we call the priests. Government deals with ongoing circumstances, uh, making decisions, uh, implementing policies, and so on, and led by an individual, the king. Jump to Christianity, a thousand years later, OK? Um, we have Jesus, who is himself, as Christianity believes, a, a, an appearance of God. So he is a hierophany. Um, but he's a hierophany that hides out with the guys. Okay? I mean, he wanders around the country with his disciples, and they eat, and they sleep together. This isn't some sort of holy other being uh, that sort of drops down from some strange uh, heavenly place, uh, and, and it really sort of frightens you. Uh, he does not found a government. Okay? Doesn't really even found a religion. Okay? He has a lot of good ideas and he has a lot of input and he says a lot of things and he certainly assembles a group of followers, but he doesn't really organize them into anything. Um, that uh, is left for his followers after he dies and they fasten on this notion that he not only died, but that he was resurrected from the dead and that somehow this resurrection uh, is important for the salvation of humanity, and they write the Gospels and their records of him uh, in, in, in order to sort of uh, lay, that out, lay out that view and, uh, uh, again, record his teachings and so on. The religion is largely uh, against the government. Uh, the Romans, uh, once they start noticing the Christians, uh, don't particularly like them. Um, this, this uh, what we would call a radical monotheism, particularly in the midst of a polytheistic society, is really sort of an unwelcome kind of a thing. Um, and the Roman government persecutes them a number of times over the next several centuries. So we haven't got a government yet. We've got a religion with Christianity, but not a government. In steps Emperor Constantine um, in about 306 not quite three centuries after Jesus' death. And at the time, the Roman Empire is governed by four emperors, and um, there's a succession problem. Uh, two of the emperors die, their sons inherit their imperial role, uh, but uh, the sons aren't friends with the others the way the fathers were friends with, with each other. So they. Each one sort of independently decides they're going to try and take over the empire. And this begins a, a very large and long uh, Roman civil war uh, with ultimately five major uh, generals uh, competing. Um, Constantine begins in Britain. He has to fight his way across Gaul, uh, takes Spain along the way, uh, finally gets into Italy uh, by about 312, and he's coming in on Rome. And in Rome is one of the other pretenders, a guy by the name of Maxentius. And Maxentius is holed up in Rome behind its real strong, thick, tall walls. And, and Constantine is thinking, oh boy, it's going to be a long siege. And the night before he arrives in Rome, he's thinking about a battle, and he's thinking about the siege, and he has a vision. 
And, and Christ appears to him, and, and the message that Christ gives him is that if you will put my sign on your banners, all Roman legions had banners, standards, I will give you the victory. And so Constantine decides to act on this. And in the night, he has all of his uh, you know, seamstresses or whomever uh, sew up some banners that have the Cairo sign, the Christus Rex uh, symbol. And they go head down towards Rome. And as they're coming to a wide, flat area with the river running through it, which is called the Milvian Bridge, what does Constantine see? but that Maxentius has taken his entire army out of Rome to meet them in a pitched battle on this big field. And they are easily wiped out. So without a huge siege, um, Constantine takes Rome and becomes the emperor of the western half of the empire. And he, uh, in keeping with this mission, gives all the glory to Jesus and to Christ and to God, etc. And he begins to well, first thing he does is he cancels the ongoing persecution that's happening at that moment. And the second thing he does is he starts mending fences and building relationships with Christian bishops where he is. Now, for the next uh, six years, he has to fight to take, it's actually 12 years, sorry. Uh, he has to fight to take control of the eastern half of the empire, and, um, which he ultimately does. And so in 324, he essentially establishes uh, a new foundation for the Roman Empire, decides to build uh, a new uh, capital, not in Rome, but in a place called Constantinople, which is modern day Istanbul, uh, very a long way away. At the time, there's nothing there. It's essentially a flat land with some swamps around it. Uh, and one of the reasons he does this is because he wants to make the empire into something that is Christian. And he creates a new court uh, where most of the courtiers are Christians, many of them are bishops. Um, and he, by creating Constantinople, he, the important thing to note is that he is not in Rome, because Rome is the home of all of the various gods of the Roman Empire. And by creating a new place, he can set up Christianity in a place where it doesn't have to compete against the old established religions. And he promotes the church, he gives it money, he pays for the bishop's travel, um, and decides to use the church since it's monotheist. What he sees in monotheism is the notion that if he could get the people of the empire to believe in the same God, then that would help him unify the empire after an 18-year civil war, uh, and that would be good. And then they, of course, in turn, could legitimate him. So in, in the next year, in 325, he calls what we call the, he calls together the first church council, the Council of Nicaea. Um, and essentially, he assigns uh, the bishops that he brings in to figure out what it is that Christianity really believes, what is really important, and what is wrong. Okay, so he sets up uh, the notion of deciding true doctrine and deciding what is a heresy. Um, and uh, there's, there's, there's a particular battle, uh, theological battle going on at this time between about the nature of Jesus, and I won't bore you with all the interesting theological details, but um, the Council of Nicaea comes down on the notion that Jesus is both God and human being, and is always both at the same time. Um, there's only one small problem. Constantine doesn't happen to believe that. Uh, so for the next um, several emperors, there's a little bit of a friction between the empire and the church, but they are still largely supportive of, of the church, and the church becomes more and more official. Uh, the central administration of the church most of the people become Christians, the leaders of the army become Christian, and then, particularly by the end of the fourth century, uh, Christianity is officially declared to be the religion, the official religion of the Roman Empire, and within about another century, by the time we get to Justinian, uh, uh, Christianity has actually taken steps to ensure the elimination of the other religions, uh, destruction of a lot of pagan temples, 
Um, in the East, you have um, what we could call attack monks. You know, monks you know, swarming in out of monasteries off the desert into a, into a city, destroying all, all the pagan temples, uh, slaughtering worshipers right and left, and then disappearing back into their monasteries in the desert. Um, and you know, whatever the legality of this, it helps further the goal of Christianizing the Roman Empire. So here we have our second model, another unified model of government and religion working together um, with this sort of executive power in the, the hands of a single person, an emperor, and the sort of uh, power over morals and ritual and, and belief, et cetera, uh, in a religious group, um, the, the, the uh, priests. And what is interesting about this that makes it different is that the religion comes down from on top. It is sort of pushed onto the society. It is not something that this, uh, grows up from within the society or for, from within the entire uh, society itself. Jump. Uh, Muhammad, born 570 uh, in um, southern Arabia, uh, an area around Mecca, which is on the northeast side of the Red Sea. Uh, it's on a trade route, major trade route between East and West, uh, but not you know, part of the sort of Mediterranean world that we usually uh, think of. Now, uh, Muhammad starts off as a trader. Okay? He runs a, tra a, tra a camel caravan business, and he's fairly successful at it. Um, but in 610, when he's about 40 years old, he, he decides there has to be more to life than that. And he starts taking these sort of religious retreats up, up to a local mountain um, where he sort of prays and seeks God and examines his conscience and everything. And the angel Gabriel starts appearing to him on behalf of God. Okay? God in, in, in Islam is called Allah, but Allah is simply Arabic for the God. So it's a title, just like it is, is in uh, English Christianity. So, um, and Gabriel keeps showing up, you know, this divine being. He keeps having this hierophany. And, and this is not what you'd expect, uh, at least from, from in our society, as, as a hierophany. These are school sessions. Angel Gabriel sits Muhammad down and teaches him things, teaches him uh, what, what are called surahs, uh, and ultimately they are collected and, and they become the Quran. And each time Gabriel and Muhammad meet, Gabriel teaches him this oral text, which Muhammad must memorize, and then Muhammad takes it back, and as he gradually uh, grows a following, he teaches it to his followers. And this is the new religious oral text uh, for uh, Muhammad. Now, the important thing about this is that it is um, monotheist. This is from God. Okay, this is not from um, um, the, any of the other polytheist gods uh, around uh, Muhammad. Now, Muhammad lives in Mecca. Mecca is the home of a place called the Kaaba. And uh, in Muhammad's early life, the Kaaba was uh, a large temple, a large shrine, where about 400 different gods were worshipped. So you can imagine that this is uh, I mean, on the one hand, it's a very important religious site, et cetera, et cetera, but also has sort of a, an economic thing. Uh, you know, this is, this is a pilgrimage site. People come to worship these gods at this site, so there's a certain amount of money going on, an economic transaction. Um, and so the Meccans don't like the notion that Muhammad's running around saying, hey, you don't need to worship 399 gods, there's only one. Um, so they start persecuting him. And right about the time the persecution starts to get really tough, uh, some emissaries from a town north called uh, Yafri uh, come and say, you know, we hear you're an honest guy uh, and, and, and sort of a capable guy, and uh, our town is sort of divided and we're having trouble and we need a good ruler. Um, so why don't you come and be our governor? So in 620, um, Muhammad and his followers move to this town which becomes known as Medina, and he becomes a governor. Well, the Meccans are still angry, so they send out armies against him, and they have three battles over the next 10 years. Uh, and so Muhammad has to be uh, a, a general. 
okay, he has to lead his armies out to fight. And in the third uh, battle, they finally, the, the Medidims finally win. Uh, they return to Mecca, they take over um, the place, they cleanse the Kaaba, make the Kaaba into a shrine to the one God, Allah. So here we have a third model um, from the beginning, okay? From the beginning, uh, Islam is both a government and a religion that guides the society. Um, military is part of that as well. Uh, so it's all one, and they have one leader, Muhammad. All works together, no, no problems, no distinctions, everything's fine, it's perfect. Now, of course, they have to change. Um, Muhammad dies. Now, interestingly, Muhammad uh, was uh, a prophet of God, and according to Islam, he is the last prophet. Uh, God keeps trying to communicate, according to Islam, with humanity, and he keeps sending prophets. He began with Adam, uh, and, then, and then there's other problem, prophets like Abraham, and, and you know, David, and Isaiah, and Jesus himself is a prophet, according to Islam. Uh, and the problem is that these prophets all bring the right message, but their followers record it wrong. So, for example, think of this. One of the, 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 the confession of faith in Islam is there is no God but Allah. There is no God but God. Okay? Good monotheistic statement. Now, think about how the notion of the Trinity, the Christian notion of the Trinity, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God the Father, that doesn't sound, there is no God but God. It doesn't fit that. So, they, so Islam would look at Christianity and say, wait a minute, you know, Jesus had the right message, but his disciples sort of came up with this Jesus is God kind of thing and, and uh, uh, doesn't quite work. So finally, the reason all this teaching was going on between Gabriel and Muhammad is because Gabriel wanted Muhammad to get the message to his followers correctly without change and make his followers memorize it correctly and that way the message would not be screwed up. So Muhammad is the last prophet according to Islam. So after he dies, nobody can inherit, can inherit the prophecy. Nobody can be a religious leader in the same way that Muhammad was a religious leader. We do have, succeeding him, what are called the four rightly guided caliphs, um, Abu Bakr, uh, Umar, Uthman, uh, and his uh, son-in-law, Ali, who uh, becomes the leader of the Shiites, ultimately. Um, and they take on the worldly character of Muhammad's role. They, they become the governors, the general community leader, they are the prayer leader, but they are not a prophet. And after we get beyond the four rightly guided caliphs, we come into what are called the time of the caliphate, or the caliphates, and these are essentially large empires. Uh, we had the Umayyad Empire, um, based in Damascus, last until about 750, and then we have the Abbasid uh, Caliphate, uh, based in Baghdad, which lasts until about 1258. And what is clearly happening in the years, the centuries of the, this time, is there's a shift where the caliph really becomes the executive leader of the state, really starts looking a lot like a king. Um, but, and he leaves the details of the religion to other people. Now, let me introduce you to a term, and this term has a certain um, meaning in today's uh, news, uh, this is uh, Sharia, the, uh, which is sort of Islamic law, okay? And in our modern Western uh, news reporting, this has extremely negative connotations. I'd like you to set those aside for a moment and try and see this as it would have been seen within Islam and uh, to some extent continues to be seen. Uh, by tradition and logic, Sharia is an uncodified body of legal doctrines, principles, values, and opinions. It was the province of the scholarly class to use interpretation and to discern the requirement of the law. Their store of knowledge, their judgment, their techniques of interpretation actually constituted the law itself. So two points I want you to see here. One is that, that, that this is essentially the rules that guide Muslim society, everything from the religion to, to commerce to 
war to criminality, etc. cetera. Um, and it's not written down. Okay? You have a group of people called scholars, called the ulama, um, and they um, essentially become experts. They study this. So to consult the Sharia during most of Islam uh, is to consult one of these scholars. Now the Sharia is a body of religious knowledge. Uh, it comes from the original sources uh, of the religion, the Quran, uh, the Sunnah, which is sort of the example the Muhammad set for his followers, and from what is called fiqh. And fiqh is essentially the recognition that no body of law covers every possible contingency. And so people actually have to figure out how to apply the existing laws to whatever new thing arises. And so fiqh is the, is the power or the responsibility of these scholars to um, apply the law where as, as needed. And so the, the scholars um, become the religious experts. And from the scholars, uh, Islam draws the judges. And a judge is someone who interprets the broad set of legal doctrines and principles, applies them to the specific case at hand. And most cases are going to be pretty standard. Everybody knows you know, what you do with the, uh, you know, somebody of this crime or that crime or that crime. Um, and, but sometimes it's, it's a little more complicated. The details of the case are a little bit more complicated. And then they have to actually think and interpret and so on. Um, this is a very common way of doing law and religion. It's very much like the rabbinic scholar of Torah uh, from about uh, the fourth, fifth century down to the modern period. It's also very much like the judge in English common law. Okay, common law is a body of knowledge that for most of its time was not written, uh, and the judge had to apply uh, their knowledge. So here we have a fourth model. Uh, this is sort of the Islamic model from mo for most of, of Islamic history, uh, at least up until the 19th century, um, where the caliph and the scholars share in the leadership of the community. The scholars are the body of religious authorities who determine and decide the sharia, decide the law. The caliph is the executive, however, who enforces that law. The scholars don't have the power of the sword, so to speak. Um, and of course, the caliph is also the active ruler who makes decisions in, in response to ongoing events. The scholars, so there's a balance here. The scholars legitimate the caliph. The caliph enforces uh, the sharia uh, for them. Jump. Back to Christianity. Uh, step back a century or two into the fifth century. Very influential thinker, Augustine of Hippo. Um, he wrote a book called The City of God. And in The City of God, he outlines the history of what he calls two cities. One is the city of man, and the other is the city of God or the city of heaven. And he does this on the analogy of, of what he sees as the, the makeup of, of the human uh, person, the human individual, body and soul. And so the city of man is the government uh, that is responsible for the physical well-being of human beings, okay? responsible for security, for clothing, for shelter, for food, for, you know, the, the order of society. And that's the executive, the government. And then you have uh, what Augustine calls the city of God. And that sort of has two parts. First, we, we think about the church, OK? And the church is guidance of the soul, the human soul. It, it's supposed to be there to look after each individual. But the church is only the extension of heaven onto earth, because the soul has an existence not just here uh, in this world, but also in the next world. So the city of God links you um, back to God, to heaven, links your soul. Um, and, and that's Augustine's model. And it's an extremely influential model. It enters into Christianity, becomes the model um, uh, for much of Catholic thought uh, after this period. And even as we move into the uh, Protestant period, it still carries some influence 
But Martin Luther, who is trained in this idea, he thinks about it and he thinks about it, and as part of the Protestant Reformation, he changes it. And he comes up with what he calls the doctrine of two kingdoms. Um, it's still sort of the earthly kingdom and the heavenly kingdom, so you got that duality. But for Luther, the earthly kingdom is both the government and the church. Anything to do in this physical world, that exists in this physical world, is part of Martin Luther's earthly kingdom. And the soul exists only in relationship to heaven. Um, and, and nothing physical. So it is ruled by the gospel, okay, the message of the gospel, and by God's grace. And for Luther, okay, this is the Protestant renovation, faith alone. The individual soul standing before God. That's all that matters for the second kingdom. Usually when you're doing a rapid survey of Christianity, you don't go Augustine, Luther, Roger Williams. Um, but, but Roger Williams um, is the creator of the notion of the separation of church and state, or at least a big promoter of it. Um, he came from England to the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1631, and Massachusetts Bay Colony was an interesting uh, experiment in religion and government, because what you have there is the notion that um, both the church is in charge of both, well, just to put this in Augustine's term, the church is in charge both of the city of man and the city of God. So everything in this world is, in, is under the governance of the church, the leaders of the church. And what that means is that that puts a big uh, crimp in your ability to follow your conscience, to speak your conscience, uh, to be true to what you believe if you do not believe exactly what the church wants you to. And Roger Williams, who agreed theologically with the Puritans right down the line, disagreed with them on their ability to determine the conscience and the ability to speak one's conscience. And for that, that caused him all sorts of trouble, got by for a few years, and finally in 1635 he was banished in the middle of winter uh, from uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, ultimately found himself in what would later become Rhode Island. Um, for those of us who spent any time in the uh, uh, New England, we know this is the armpit of the universe. Um, <laughs> And um, it, it was very much like that. Okay, it was the middle of nowhere. It was the wilderness. Uh, it was, for the first year or so, just Roger Williams and the Indians. Uh, and gradually, all these misfits, uh, people who didn't fit into the various other colonies, started gathering around Roger Williams. So although he had a very strong sense of his own beliefs, even when they changed frequently. Uh, so for example, Roger Williams, founded the first Baptist church in America. Uh, and then eight months later, he split from it. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but he thought that freedom of belief and freedom of conscience was, was the important thing. And the way to ensure that was the separation of church and state. And, and his ideas combined um, both thoughts from Augustine and Luther. The state and the church separately governed, but rather than the church controlling the people, the people and their conscience controlled the church, which was a very strange notion at his time. And this he encapsulated with the, with the phrase soul liberty. So uh, Roger Williams' model is that the religion is controlled by the community and their consciousness, conscience, not the other way around. And he didn't really care about the nature of the government. Um, it could be almost anything as long as, as the church ran um, the, the religion side of it. So that wasn't a very stable model. So if we push on to the Enlightenment, um, we can get another, another moment. Um, for Roger Williams, what was important was the individual conscience. And as we move into the Enlightenment, what becomes important is not the conscience, but the mind, each individual's mind what they can think. And whereas people like Williams were guided by revelation and natural law in what they were trying to figure out, the Enlightenment 
thinkers just threw both of those things out. Uh, revelation, who knew? Uh, because it couldn't be accessed by the mind. Okay? We didn't know whether it was actually revealed because we didn't have a link to it. And what's important about nature is that you can observe nature and work out laws from it, not that there are laws of nature that you are taught. Um, so the issue here is thought, rationality, and observation. So the Enlightenment provides uh, for rational thought. Each individual being, human, is capable of rational thought, and this elevates the power of reason. Each of our individuals' power of reason uh, to the way to think about things. Now, that's uh, an important thought here. Because if you ask the question now, who belongs to the state? Who is actually governed by the rules of the state? In a Christian nation, or a Muslim nation, or, or what uh, was the Jewish nation, say under David, the laws were for the members of the religion. And if you didn't belong to the religion, the laws in many ways just didn't apply to you. Uh, during the Crusades, when we have these huge pogroms of Jews uh, by the Crusaders on their way to, uh, to, uh, to the Middle East, uh, the Jews don't have protection of, of the uh, people, uh, of, the, of the security apparatus of the police in the various cities. So when various rampaging Crusaders, often drunk, uh, decide to attack the Jews, the only things that the Jews can do to protect themselves is essentially to run to the bishop, the local bishop, and throw, them on, throw themselves on his mercy and hope that he will protect them from the Christians who are trying to injure them. Okay, Because the laws don't apply unless you belong to the religion. So when we suddenly change the character of how you belong to the nation from being a member of a religion to having reason, suddenly everybody, no matter what their religion, can be a member of the nation, can be a citizen. And that's where the notion of a citizen comes from. Prior to that, we really don't have the idea of a citizen. Next step. So if the government is for all of the citizens, who runs the government? Well, the Enlightenment argues that it comes from the people that supreme executive power derives from a mandate from the masses, not from some farcical aquatic ceremony, as Susan will teach us uh, in the next lecture. <laughs> uh, the government is authorized by all the individuals in the community. Uh, election of the executive and the election of the legislative branches, and these in turn authorize a legal branch. So suddenly what you have is the check and balance that we saw in, say, Luther's uh, and Augustine's and uh, even, even the Islamic notion of the scholars balancing the caliph, um, all of that is now shifted out of the religion and into the side of the government. Okay, that's one of the achievements of, of the Enlightenment. So here we have this, this model that really sort of governs uh, modern Western society. Uh, government power does not come from on high, doesn't come from God, it doesn't come from some sort of supreme human lords, uh, but is decided upon by the community it governs. Uh, in some form, there is election of the executive and legislative branches uh, who uh, essentially govern the law and guide things. Uh, the religion and its group of leaders may or may not be community-wide. Okay, you may be in England where everybody is supposedly Episcopalian, or I'm sorry, Anglican, uh, or you could be uh, in a country like America we have, where we have a variety of religions. Um, just to sort of lay out a couple of uh, interesting points, in America, as we're developing this, we of course emphasize the separation of church and state uh, and, and really uh, cut the link so that there is no state-sponsored um, religions. In Europe, particularly in Northern Europe, uh, they kept the notion of a state-sponsored religion even as they created laws that ensured the freedom of religion, uh, and even though most people didn't actually follow the state religion. Um, interestingly, today, uh, you know, of course, we survey everything. Uh, which do you think 
uh, which model do you think has the most vibrant religious societies? The American model or the European model? The American model. The American model where we separate, where we have radical separation of church and state. We've got vibrant religious life, etc. Go visit England sometime um, and visit all the empty churches. Uh, church attendance in America is something like 40 to 50 percent of people show up in a church once a month at least. Uh, in Britain, it's about 10 percent. Um, in Denmark, uh, I was the last time I visited there, I was told it was about 5 percent. Uh, but it was a great place to get married. All these wonderful churches, very picturesque places for weddings. Um, so let's jump again uh, back over to Islam. Um, in the 19th century, uh, particularly at the beginning of the 19th century, about two-thirds of the lands around the Mediterranean uh, world are, are run by the Ottoman Empire, okay, which was founded in the 14th century uh, when, when the Ottoman Turks took control of Constantinople and changed it into Istanbul. By the 19th century, uh, the Ottoman Turks uh, need money. Uh, the Western governments are willing to lend it to them, but they need it. Um, so um, they push through some reforms, and one of the reforms is the notion that the Sharia, the law, should be written down, made into a code. And this code becomes known as the Masel. And once codified, the, the judges don't seem to have noticed this as it was happening, but once codified, it can be applied by anybody. You don't need some sort of huge, decades-long training in Sharia to be a Sharia judge, lawyer, whatever. Anybody who can read the list and has a little bit of background in the law can do it. Um, so who becomes the balance? Okay, if you don't need the, the Sharia scholars, who becomes the balance against the caliph? Well, they have constitutional reform in Ottoman Turkey uh, in 1876. Um, they create a legislature to provide that balance. Um, scholars are largely eliminated by this point. Um, they start meeting in 1878. Uh, there's a coup. Next, next um, Sultan in decides to eliminate the legislature, and he's the one that essentially uh, runs the country until the start, just before the start of World War I. Um, and he never calls the legislature back. So this creates a model in Islam for pure, what, what we in the West would think of as a pure dictatorship, a, a, a country without checks and balances on the single individual who runs the country. Now, after World War I, um, the Western powers win. Um, they take over the Ottoman Empire. They cut it up into nation states. And each of these nation states creates a constitutional government. And most of them adopt uh, governments like the uh, a code, a law code like the Masel, the Sharia, um, and they all have legislatures and um, take this in two directions. Uh, they keep developing the notion of codifying the Sharia. So you have an Egyptian scholar by the name of Al Sanhuri, uh, who during the 20th century combined, you know, he could see that there were some problems with the Sharia and certain things just sort of didn't fit with the modern world uh, ruled by technology and fast transportation and that kind of stuff. And so he blended aspects, took, brought in aspects of Western law and Western ideas and put them into the Sharia. And this also became extremely uh, widely spread uh, among some of these states. So here we have the new model. Um, executive power controls the society. There's no balance from religion. And although there is a legislature, almost every Muslim state, not everyone, but most of them, uh, essentially figure out a way of emasculating the legislature, either by simply getting rid of it, not calling it, or simply depriving it of power, uh, like it was in Egypt, for example. Um, so the law is no longer separated, is no, has been separated from the religion. Society uh, is guided by a mix of religion, but uh, they're not really linked anymore. It's much more of a Western style uh, society. So we hit the Arab Spring. Let me just talk about this briefly and then we can do some questions. Um, we had the Arab Spring. Uh, people in Tunisia, people in Egypt overthrew their rulers. They thought, thought it was unjust. Um, so what did they want? 
Well, the first thing I want to make clear that Model 7 just failed. The, the dictatorships, the Islamic dictatorships of, of the 20th century just was not what they wanted. Uh, you know, you can look at what's going on in Syria today and see exactly why the dictatorship is not what you want. Um, what did they want? They wanted justice. And throughout the 20th century, we find writers and thinkers and uh, groups forming who want justice. They want political justice, social justice, legal justice, and of course the, um, the main cry of the Arab Spring was economic justice. They wanted jobs. I mean, let's be blunt here. Now, here's another term I'm going to throw out that has a negative connotation, but I'd like you to set that aside for a moment. Islamism. Okay, Islamists. Islamists. Um, justice, uh, Islamism is essentially uh, a modern Islamic movement uh, developed during um, the 20th century. It is largely developed in response to the West. Many of its thinkers were actually trained in the West. They went to Western universities, mostly European. Um, and they were exposed to the various types of modern government. Communism, so socialism, uh, democracy, uh, economic things like, like uh, capitalism, uh, uh, more of the uh, welfare state, etc. They, they, they saw all of these things happening and they saw things that they liked and they saw things they didn't like. And so they knew it didn't quite fit back home in the, in the Muslim countries, but there were some good things they wanted to take back. So um, they did a lot of thinking, and the, this, this movement that we so uh, easily sort of dismiss as in Islamism is an attempt to take uh, modern Western ideas of governance, of the relationship between church and state, and put them into an Islamic context, usually on the base, of course, of Sharia. Um, and they bring in notions of reason, Western notions of citizenship, Western notions of governance uh, by, by the citizens. Um, and their notion it has always been, uh, I mean, people like the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, weren't averse sometimes to using um, violence. Um, but what they really wanted to do uh, was to essentially somehow get into political power and essentially legislate uh, an Islamic, uh, Islamist state into existence. Now, in a world where it's the scholars that are supposed to know the Sharia, know the religion, Islamism is probably Protestant Islam in that they don't want the scholars. They don't want the old style uh, experts. They think the Sharia should be accessible to everybody. In fact, they sound a lot like Martin Luther, who says, not the church. Salvation doesn't come from the church, but it comes from the gospel, the gospel alone, and for the individual, by faith alone. Okay, now it's a different religion. Let's, let's not confuse that. But essentially what they're trying to do is make accessible the Sharia and the principles, the key principles, not the ones that have been imposed over centuries, but the key sort of core divinely given principles available and link that with the best stuff out of the West. So Sharia, when you ask what does Sharia mean to say a protester in Egypt or Tunisia, okay, most of them aren't really dedicated Muslims, you know. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not the kind that actually pray five times a day, okay? They, they're, they're Western educated, they've gone to school, they have college degrees, uh, they want jobs. Uh, yeah, it's their religion. They're not quite the equivalent of C&E Christians, but, you know, it's not really a big thing for them. What Sharia means to them is this is the law that hasn't been corrupted hasn't been corrupted by the dictators, hasn't been corrupted by the conquerors from the West, uh, whether you think of them as Christian or secular or Western or whatever. And when you get rid of all that, all of those sources of corruption, the Sharia is the only thing left that has any sort of resonance. Okay? You can't sort of expect them to become Christian. You can't expect them to become radical secularists. I mean, even those of us who grew up with the Enlightenment aren't radical secularists. 
So they have to do something comfortable that fits with them. Uh, so what they think is that on Sharia, whatever it means, that a mu just Muslim society can be built and they want to combine it with the rule of the people, by the people, and for the people. So whereas during most of the 20th century, Muslim nations had no balance, only dictatorship, uh, Islamism thinks that a constitutional government based on the Sharia as transformed for modern world, a world where people vote uh, for and legitimate the government, can provide a solid foundation for new national order in these countries. Um, and this is just more or less repetitive. And we come to model eight, which is, I've looked at some of these ideals for balancing government, society, religion, and military in the countries of the Arab Spring. Um, most of these options are known and available. How will they be put together? I don't know. This is what they will do for their own societies in some way that will make sense to them and make comfortable for them. It's not our project. It's their project. We should let their hope guide it and keep our fear out of it. Thank you. Now I have a few minutes for questions. It seems to me that your view of religion is very uh, secular and, and not spiritual, and particularly of Judaism and Christianity that seem to evolve, in, in your view, through a need to either emerge from a dominant role uh, of another dominion, or to create or and unify a, a group of tribal states. That's my understanding. Is, would you say that's an accurate understanding? I would say this that as a scholar of religion, I don't have access to people's souls or to God, okay? I've been studying this 45 years. I hate to say it that long. <laughs> uh, and I, I know everything about how religion works in this world, and I have no way of testing anything above that world. And so when I look out and I see religion, I don't see a spiritual life, uh, except in as people write about it in books of devotion or something like that. What I see is human organizations. And, and that's what is happening in this world. That's what affects people. I mean, individuals may have a, have a spiritual life. Um, I can't make broad sweeping generalizations about it. Uh, fair enough. <clears throat> Other thought, question? Yes, in back. I'd be interested to hear your perspective on the dynamic of um, Sharia law with respect to our justice system here in the U.S., there's some uh, there's some development of contention about Sharia law being applied in our current legal system, and I'd just be interested on your. Um, you know, almost every religion has laws, rules, morality, rules about who can marry who, what the status of the kids are, how you be, how you worship God, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, If you ever gone around and visited the different religions here in the United States, uh, if you go visit a Jewish temple, you'll discover that their marriage laws are different from Catholicism, which, by the way, st still practices a number of things of canonical law, which people were dying to get rid of just a few centuries ago. Um, so we are a nation of the secular law, and we let religions guide the behavior of their own believers in their own law. Um, and it's a voluntary thing. I mean, that's what's weird. I mean, that's really what makes people uncomfortable is that religious law and belief is volunteerism. You only, it only applies to you if you want it to. You want to turn your back on it and walk away? You can. And Sharia fits in Sharia in America fits exactly the same way. It applies to Muslims if they want it to apply. It applies to nobody else. There's no state apparatus to pick it up. Yes? I suppose what many of us think about when we hear of Sharia law is uh, couples being stoned to death in Afghanistan, uh, thieves having their right hands cut off, and uh, other matters of uh, what I would call cultural issues rather 
Mm -hmm. and, and, and we find that yucky? Or we find that yucky. Do we see that changing with this onset of Islam? Well, well what we, see, we see a couple of things. Um, one is most Muslims think that's yucky too. Uh, they, they are embarrassed by it. They think that's part of, of you know, sort of the old way of doing things. And that's part of the debate about what you're doing with these, this, these scholars and what you're doing with Sharia. I mean, most people who call for the establishment of Sharia at the moment, particularly in the wake of the Arab Spring, see Sharia as the way they know what it's like to live under a dictator. And many of them know what it's like to live under oppression from the West or the interference of Western military powers. Those are directions that they find attractive. So what they find attractive is, you know, the law given to Moses, I mean, if you're Jewish, I mean, you, you, you idealize that, even if you don't like all the details. Um, and you sort of try to do that. And, and so Sharia is this symbol of the God-given law that came from Muhammad, came from God via Muhammad, uh, and, and was embodied in his uh, prophetic uh, life on earth. And, I've, and so there's a real, um, you know, di there's a real different view. And we have to let them have their view. The, you know, they're not going to live with the society that we impose on them. They're going to live with the society that they create, and hopefully after a couple of iterations, it will fit. I mean, if you think of the creation of the United States, I mean, we went through two constitutions. We had the League of uh, the, um, the, Confederation, the Confederation, and then we had the, the Constitution. So, you know, we might get it right the first time. Uh, one more question, and then I got to think. Uh, is it just a matter of degree? I mean, uh, they're not very much different than we are. Um, internal ultrasounds seem to me to be sort of the same <laughs> thing as cutting off your hand. <laughs> okay, I think I'll let that one just sort of set there. And uh, um, if, if we can continue these conversations in, in the lunch conversation afterwards. So. Uh, uh, let's take a break and uh, get something uh, ready for something a little more uh, live.